Welcome back to Minitorch. We're now on to module 2.0, and this module will focus on tensors and neural networks. Today's class will give a mini ML overview of what neural networks are and what they do. So as a reminder, we've been so far building up the infrastructure to allow us to take derivatives of arbitrary Python functions with respect to their input. This allows us to say, take a function like expression here, which is defined in terms of two scalar values, compute the mathematical expression of these functions, and then compute a derivative. The main case we're interested in is a chain. So given a composition of two functions f and g, we can take a derivative of their composed value. We do this by running a forward pass, which computes z, which is the value for the first box, and then the final output, f of g of x. We then run a backwards pass, where we start from the right-hand side, moving to the left, computing the derivative of each term, and multiplying them together by the chain rule. In more complex cases, such as two-argument functions, the complexity is hidden on the box that it is used. So in this example here, the first box takes two arguments, but we can still run the same chain rule process from right to left. That means the second box doesn't even have to know that the first box took in two arguments. It just computes its individual local derivative, passes that value back, which is then multiplied by the derivative of the first box. We covered some more complex cases as well last lecture, such as where the first box produces a single output, which is then used multiple times downstream. The main thing you need to know about these uh, occurrences is that we sum up the derivatives on the backward pass. So if a variable is used multiple times, the derivative that it backpropagates is the sum of all of the derivatives that reach that middle point. So here we are computing a z1 and a z2 value in the middle, and we're adding up the values of the derivatives from the right-hand side. At the end of module one, you implemented full backpropagation. So that means you run this process over a graph where at each step of the process, you are passing some information back through each of the boxes. If you implement this correctly, you should only go through each of the boxes one time in order to compute the derivative of all the individual leaf arguments. So here, if our final value is h, we'll run a process of going through each box until we end up with the derivative of h with respect to x and y. In today's class, we're going to take this idea and go back to the problem of machine learning. In particular, we're going to remind ourselves how model training works, introduce the concept of neural networks, and then prep ourselves for some more advanced future models. So let's begin by reminding ourselves what we know about machine learning so far. We've introduced three concepts in this class. The first was the data set, which was the underlying data we wanted to fit. Next was the model, which determined the shape of the fit. And finally, we talked about loss, which tells us how well we fit the underlying data. We've particularly focused so far on linear models. Linear models correspond to shapes of the following form. We're going to divide the red side and the blue side of our decision boundary based on a line. We've talked about several different losses, but let's stick with a ReLU-based loss for its simplicity. We'll simply take loss based on how well or poorly each point was classified. If it's on the correct side, we take no loss. If it's on the incorrect side, we take some loss. The main goal of the class is to fit the parameters of the model such that we get the best loss. We've talked about this so far in terms of parameter fitting of linear models, where we move around the decision boundary based on the data itself. When we talk about parameter fitting, there are three high-level steps. The first is computing the loss function itself. We'll do this using forward. The second is check how small changes would impact the loss. We do this by using backward. In particular, we forward the L function, then we backwards to get the derivative with respect to the parameters. Once we've done this, we update the parameters to reduce the loss, giving us the pictures in the previous slide. The update procedure itself can be seen as making movements on the underlying graph. Given each of the points that we have access to, we simply compute a derivative 
which tells us how to move on the underlying loss itself. Updating the parameters corresponds to a movement on this graph. In this picture here, we're referring to only one of the different parameters. In practice, we'll update them all simultaneously. Now let's connect this back to the code in Minitorch. I've been using shorthand to describe a linear model, but now let's actually use the module structure that we build up in our last homework assignment. We'll define a class that represents a linear module. It will have uh, as its init uh, the standard boilerplate where we initialize the superclass. And then we'll define three parameters, w1, w2, and bias. I'll define these as scalars, and I'll set their initial value to 0.0. .0. In addition, we're going to add a new method that we haven't seen before. This method will actually compute the module's value on real data. So here we'll give it an x1 and an x2, both of which represent the scalar features of the input. We'll also take self as an argument to access the parameters, and we'll output a new scalar value. The value we return is the mathematical function for linear. Note that it looks like just a standard Python numerical computation. But remember, we are using the scalar machinery and under the hood calling scalar functions. Once we have this module, we can actually train it on data. This is the fitting process we've described so far. We first define our input x1 and x2. We then call this new model.forward function. This returns a scalar value loss. Note that this loss is computed by calling all the forwards on the scalar functions under the hood. And we could actually look at the graph structure itself. Once we have this graph structure, we can then call backwards. Backwards will go over the computational graph and compute the derivative of this loss value with respect to all of the input parameters. Note that we don't actually see the parameters here. The parameters are stored in this model variable. If we wanted to access them, we would have to call named parameters. However, if you were to do that, you would see that when you call loss.backward, the dot derivative member of each of these parameters now contains the derivative we need. In our third step, we actually update the parameters. We do this by calling optim.step. We won't focus on this function too much in this class, but note that it uses these derivatives to make a change to the parameters. Now, I haven't been making too much of a distinction between the machine learning model and these underlying modules, um, but let me note that in this particular case, we're using linear as a full machine learning model. In practice, though, we can also just use linear as a partial module for others to call, and we can also define it to be slightly more general. So in particular, let's define now a function lin. This is a parameterized function that has weights and biases. Uh, it may have multiple weights and biases more than our two that we've started with. If we want to define this in, in PyTorch, we would define it like this, where um, we have many different parameters for each of the different weights. This is a little uh, inconvenient for now. Uh, we'll see in the future a better and cleaner way to write this. Uh, but the point I want to make is that for the homework, you'll need to utilize a module of this form. And this doesn't have to be the whole model itself. It could be used as a submodule for other models. To see this in practice, let's use linear to construct a neural network. So for a linear model, we were able to adjust the parameters to adjust the decision boundary of our curve. However, as we saw, this doesn't always work when we get to harder data sets. So even this somewhat simplistic looking data set starts to show some issues with using a linear model. In particular, if we try to use a linear model to classify these points, we can find that basically any model we construct is going to have a very bad loss. There's just no way to divide up these points such that you can get them on the right side of a single line. We're going to use this simple example as a motivation for defining a neural network. This is a new model that we're looking at. And the main thing I want you to take away from a neural network is that it's going to use repeated splits of the underlying data.
Each of these splits will be an application of a linear and what's known as an activation function. By doing this, we'll be able to classify much harder data sets. The other thing to note, though, is that none of the other details we've described so far are changing. We're really only changing the model part of this process. So here's the intuition for neural networks. We're going to apply several different linear separators. We're then going to use these linear separators to reshape the data points based on their results. Once we do that, we'll just apply a simple linear model on the new space to make our classification. To do this, we're going to need a little bit of new notation. Um, I'm going to use a superscript to indicate different sets of parameters and a subscript to indicate different values within that parameter set. We're going to, in uh, this section of the course, define a very nice notation for doing this. Um, but for now, just bear with me with uh, this uh, kind of intermediate notation. So returning back to our data set, we're going to assume that we've used a linear separator to just split off the points on the left here. This is a single line that we've drawn through the points. And we've drawn this line such that points on the yellow side will have a positive value and points on the white side will have a zero value. In fact, you can think about this as being exactly what we've done so far in that it's applying a linear separator and then applying a ReLU. So if we look at LU, we'll see that it's divided the points up into two parts. The points that were on the yellow side of the graph now have a positive value, and all the other points have a zero value. Mathematically, this just corresponds to the following equation. We've set H1 equal to ReLU of a linear applied to x. And that linear had parameters w superscript 0 and b superscript 0. We can do exactly the same thing to the right-hand points. Here we draw another linear separator, which splits off the points on the right-hand side of the graph. The points in green have a positive value, and everything else has a zero value. Here's what this looks like mathematically. We're simply applying a ReLU to a linear. That linear has a different set of parameters, w1 and b1. We look at, look at the reshaped ReLU. Two of these have a positive value, and everything else has zero. Here's the punchline. If we draw a reshaped version where the graph has two axes, one corresponding to the yellow value and one corresponding to the green value, we'll see that the points end up in the following positions on the graph. The two points on the left end up on the yellow axis, whereas the two points on the right end up on the green axis. All of the circle values end up at 0, 0. Once we've done this, we can now easily draw a linear separator that splits off the red and the blue points. This means we've succeeded and we've correctly classified our data. In fact, we can go back to all the, de the decision boundary on the original graph, and we'll see that by making these two initial splits and then fitting a linear separator, we're able to split the original points into the following areas. Everything on the left-hand side is red, and everything on the right-hand side is blue. To see the whole equation mathematically, things get a little bit more complex. The yellow is h1, the green is h2. Both of these are ReLUs applied to a linear equation. m then becomes a linear applied to h1 and h2. And we end up with nine parameters, three for each of these linears. We can make, make things slightly simpler if we use our lin function, if we pass lin to x and apply a ReLU that gives us h1, and lin applied to x with our second parameters gives us h2, finally we can classify things in our final model. Again, the notation is not great, but we're going to see in this section of the class how to make it much simpler. I'll end by showing the code in Minitorch. So as a reminder, this was our linear module. It has three parameters, w1, w2, and b, and it has a method forward that computes the linear equation that we've seen so far. This is mathematically equivalent to the lin function. To produce our neural network, we're going to have three submodules, one for yellow, one for green, and one for our final classification. This is the first time we've seen submodules, but we can see that they make it easy to split out certain parts 
and easy to count up the total number of parameters. Finally, forward will actually compute the function we're interested in, first by computing h1, then by computing h2, and finally classifying based on h1 and h2. Note that even though we're calling three different functions here, really what we're doing is computing the forward computational graph. That's because all of this is applied to scalars, and all of these scalars just construct the computational graph behind the scenes. Finally, we can look at the parameters and train them. We'll call this network model, and we'll look at its named parameters. We can see that we had three parameters for each of the submodules for a total of nine parameters. If we call forward on some input values and compute our loss function, this corresponds to constructing the forward graph. We can then also see that by calling um, this make graph function, we can actually see the full computational graph that was constructed. If we call backward, we can then get the derivative for each of the parameters. We can even look at these directly. If I look at a given name parameter, say unit one, w1, and look for its derivative value, we can see where the derivative was stored and accessible. Okay, so that about does it for our intro to neural networks. Uh, obviously, this is an extremely simplistic neural network with only nine parameters. Uh, we'll be building up to much more complex neural networks in the future. But I do want to note that even though they have many more parameters, their structure is actually not much more complicated than what we've seen so far. Um, so if you understand this idea of multiple splits leading to a simple classification problem, you're actually pretty far in your way on understanding more complex neural networks.